Test 1. This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man phoning an aquatic centre inquiring about a part-time job as a lifeguard. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, North Bay Aquatic Centre. Jane is speaking. Oh, hello. I'm calling to apply for a part-time lifeguard position. Am I speaking to the right person? Yes, you are. We are currently recruiting lifeguards for two different positions. But first, I'll have to jot down some of your personal information before we officially invite you for an interview. Is that all right? Sure, no problem. May I have your name, please? It's Peter, Peter Smith. OK, and what is your current address? It's 130 South Main Street, Lake Elsinore. I'm sorry, Elsinore? Oh, it's E-L-S-I-N-O-R-E, -E, Elsinore. Right, got it. What is your phone number? My home phone number is 077-995362. Actually, it's easier to reach me by my cell phone number. It's 077-896-24. Five. I'm mainly out these days. Right. Can you tell me about your work experience? Well, I now work as a waiter, and that's just a part-time gig. It requires serving customers, and I also have some cleaning duties. OK. Do you have any other part-time job? No, but I'm majoring in physical education right now. I'm learning exercise physiology sports nutrition and individual fitness activities and I want to become a baseball coach for a local high school. So, do you have any other relevant work experience to a lifeguard position? Oh, right. I also worked part-time as a rescue diver for a local beach last summer. I'm certified for open water rescue missions. Excellent. That's exactly what we're looking for. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Before we continue, I need to know a few more things to ensure that you are qualified for maintaining water safety during work. OK, go ahead. As a lifeguard, you will spend most of your time monitoring the area near the water 
and reducing risks to everyone here. So we are looking for someone who can stay focused. Do you have difficulties concentrating or any related disorders? No, I don't have any medical disorders relating to that sort of problem. We're also expecting someone with good eyesight because a lifeguard must be able to recognize and respond to any struggling swimmers quickly. I have sharp vision. I mean, both eyes are 2010 without correction. Good. Do you have relevant skills in terms of lifeguarding? I'm good at diving. You know, my previous job requires training in that. We only need lifeguards with certification. I assume you already have one, right? Yes. To get the certificate, I received training for waterfront lifeguarding two years ago. The training includes things like providing first aid and emergency care. But mine is about to expire in November. Oh, wait, let me check. It's a month earlier, in October. OK, you're good for now before it expires. But if you want to work here for the whole year, you'll have to renew it. I see. What time do you prefer to work? I already work part-time in a restaurant on weekdays, so I'd like to work on the weekend. We already have enough people working here on Sundays. I can work on Saturday mornings then. Right. And I can start from six o'clock in the morning. I'm a morning person. Sounds great. Where did you hear about our recruitment information from? I heard it on radio this morning while driving. I wouldn't say I like reading newspapers. Thank you for calling. We'll notify you about the interview details in two days. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear part of a radio programme about a new route for cyclists called the Almsden Way. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to our holiday special. Today, I'll be talking about a new cycle route in this area called the Elmston Way. It's well signposted, so you can see exactly where to go, and it's an easy ride with no steep hills. It's 35 kilometres long from Elmston to Langton and consists partly of cycle paths and partly of roads. Let me outline the route briefly, starting at Elmston Railway Station. The first part is a cycle path running eastwards, roughly parallel to the rail track. Almost immediately, the railway curves away and goes around the southern side of a little lake, but the cycle path takes the northern route around the lake. Keep your eyes open for the swans that nest there. The path then joins the road, and the next landmark is a group of massive rocks that tower over the countryside. You'll see them to the east of the road, just before the road goes under the railway. They're imposing. Soon, you'll come to a fork in the road, where you'll leave the road and head off towards the river. But if you want to make a detour to Corley Nature Reserve, go straight on instead of leaving the road here. Continuing along the cycle path, you'll reach the River Cleave. The cycle path follows the river southwards. After a bit, you'll see the Ashington China Factory, which closed in 1962. It now offers guided tours to the public, which is worth a visit. Right after the factory, there's a bridge over the river, 
and you carry on with farmland to the north, right after the bridge, and the Langton Forest to the south. Somewhere between the cycle route and the railway line, sighted a statue of Captain Cook, which dates back to the 18th century. The route ends at Langton Village, where you'll find a railway station. So you can either catch the train here or cycle back to Elmston. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. One point to remember when cycling on the Elmsden Way is to keep your eyes open for sheep, which occasionally stray onto the cycle path from the adjoining fields. So be careful to avoid accidents. The park is well constructed, so wet or muddy conditions do not affect it. There will be old cars or tractors when you're cycling on roads, but most traffic has been diverted to the main road that bypasses the whole area. Now, a bit more about some of the places you'll see. The starting point, Elmston Station, was quite busy in the early 20th century, with services to several major cities, but it was closed in the 1950s. Eventually, a small company was set up to turn it into a sort of railway museum, maintaining it in the style of the 1950s, and the station was ready for trains to start using it again earlier this year. It's only used by a few local trains, though. There's a visitor's centre at the station, which houses a small exhibition about the history of railway transport all over the world, and a facility for hiring bikes if you don't have one of your own. A small shop just across the road from the station also sells refreshments. As I said, you can cycle to Langton and return to Elmston by train or the other way because you can take your cycle on the train. There's no need to make a reservation, there's plenty of room and no extra charge. However, the service is limited and the trains between these places don't run on weekdays. If you want to see the River Elm, there's a footpath from Elmsden Station, and you can safely leave your bike in the car park there. Leave yourself plenty of time, though. Going down is easy, but climbing up is pretty steep, so walking back up to the top can take quite a while. But it's worth the effort. The scenery is lovely, and the footpath runs right next to the river down to a waterfall. Finally, there are many other cycle paths if you like to do more cycling in the area. We'll be talking on the radio about them, and you'll be able to get fuller details in the Saturday edition of the local paper. The National Cycle Network also has some details on its website, although I have to say they don't have any local ones yet but that may change, so get out your bicycle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear two students, Erica and Ian, discussing their presentation on volcanoes in their geology course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, Ian. How far along are you on preparing the presentation on volcanoes next week? Not much. Maybe we can straighten things out first? Sure. I decided to start with Shield Volcano. The name derives from its similarity in shape to a warrior's shield lying face up. The Hawaiian Shield Volcanoes are the most famous examples. Professor Joan mentioned that many scholars have already done quite a lot of research in this field. We could retell conclusions from published papers. I'm not sure. I mean, is that even allowed? I know we don't have to use first-hand data we collect, but copy in others? Come on. It's not like we are using their findings as our own. The professor said it would be OK, as long as we cited our sources. Oh, OK. Do you have any ideas about stratovolcanoes? Stratovolcanoes, also known as composite volcanoes, develop over many thousands of years through repeated eruptions and other volcanic activity. But the current information I have at hand is only very vague. Fuller descriptions are needed for this. I'm sure you can find them. All right then, leave that to me. Have you read anything about rhyolite caldera complexes? Yeah, they are the most explosive volcanoes on Earth and don't even look like volcanoes. The origin of these volcanoes, like Yellowstone, is associated with a hot spot. You've got most of the information correct. Unfortunately, the last bit you mentioned is wrong. The origin of this type of volcano remains a mystery. The hotspot origin theory doesn't work for most other rhyolite calderas. Right, I'll change that part. What about the position on monogenetic fields? It's shocking to see the photos of these immense volcanoes. There are numerous monogenetic fields in the American Southwest and Mexico, but I got all the information from a website without specifying its source. We'll have to examine the content again later. OK, I can help with that. Lastly, we have cinder cones. What do you have on that? Well, this type of volcano is usually tiny to the other volcanoes and thus sounds less attractive. Maybe we should leave it out. It seems pretty unimportant to me. I agree. It's impossible to cover everything. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Erica, can you work on the delivery part? I don't want to do it anymore. I'm OK with that, but why is that? I was marked so low for the last presentation and didn't even have a clue why. Maybe it's because I didn't include enough data on it. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think maybe you did not prepare the topic well enough. You tried to explain the contributing factor forming the ring of fire in the Pacific Ocean, but you just read everything out loud without fully comprehending it yourself. Right, that must have been it. We also have to look for supporting materials to illustrate the formation of different volcanoes. What about documentaries? They can be an excellent way to illustrate the volcanic eruption, but that might be too long for our presentation. We've only got 20 minutes. Have you considered adding photos to our handouts? That's an option. 
but people may focus on these photos rather than paying attention to what we have to say. Maybe we can search online for part of a film about volcanoes and add it to the end of our presentation. That would be better. So, how should we start our presentation? Maybe we can first introduce some terms like extinct volcanoes and dormant volcanoes. Why is that? Even though they are widely accepted terms among ordinary people, academia wouldn't accept them because there are no set definitions. For example, an extinct volcano would be one nobody expects to erupt again. But there have been several eruptions from widely acknowledged extinct volcanoes. That's an excellent way to start our presentation. What did the professor say about your last presentation? There is still room for improvement. She said that I had an in-depth analysis and provided enough statistics, but I didn't carry on and discuss my take on it. Right. So maybe we could also discuss the impact volcanoes have on humans and our planet. Yeah, there's little doubt that volcanoes have been instrumental in wiping out countless species during major extinction events. But volcanic activity also shapes new habitats, enriching the soil with nutrients that allow life to thrive. People haven't realised that there are abundant mineral resources waiting to be exploited in volcanoes. I agree. So now we can. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear part of a biology lecture about dolphins and how views divide over their level of intelligence. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, we'll dive into the topic of dolphin intelligence, discussing dolphin behaviour and their physical structure in an attempt to shed light on the question, how intelligent are dolphins? Well, concerning body size, dolphin brains are among the largest in the animal kingdom more extensive than chimpanzees, and certain species, like bottlenose dolphins, have brains even bigger than humans. However, some current tests suggest that they do not possess the same cognitive abilities as humans, despite having a similar brain size. For instance, dolphins are often trapped in gill nets, originally intended for tuna fishing. These entanglement cases have led to unnecessary injury or deaths of dolphins, gradually depleting their numbers. Clearly, dolphins don't realise that they could just jump over these vertical barriers and swim to safety. People often mistakenly view dolphins' eternal smile as signs of intelligence and joy. Actually, this is not a facial expression at all, but a fixed design of their head. Unlike human beings with greater than 40 facial muscles, dolphins have no such powers with which to form an expression. On the other hand, small-brained animals are sometimes underrated 
for their level of intelligence. Pigeons and rats are typical examples of small brain animals which can perform tasks so complex that most humans would have trouble with them. Over the last few decades, scientists have conducted countless studies on the cognitive abilities of these overlooked animals with quite surprising results. Pigeons are aware of their bodies when they see their reflections in the mirror. Pigeons are also trained under specific conditions and gradually form instinctive reactions. In an experiment in 2009, a group of 12 pigeons was given a reward like food and water every time they pecked a key on a lab table. All birds successfully performed the trick. These test results indicate that brain size is probably not the sole factor in determining intelligence. Another argument steers the attention to the correlation between intelligence and the constituents of brains, rather than their sheer sizes. It's been found that dolphin brains are comprised chiefly of fatty cells, which serve as a protective barrier between the systemic blood and the extracellular environment of the central nervous system. They are also essential components of nerve cell membranes affecting problem-solving skills performance. Now, the second mainstream view is that dolphins are highly intelligent. Research into the behavior of dolphins in the wild and in captivity has yielded incredible data on the intelligence of these marine mammals. Studies show that dolphins not only have the ability to learn as individuals, but those individuals can then pass their new knowledge on to others. Let's take a look at some typical examples. Among these are tested with Billy, a dolphin trapped in a sea lock and rescued. Billy spent three weeks in rehabilitation and was released back into the wild. There, researchers noticed that Billy had started tail walking, a skill only mastered by captive dolphins who imitated the keepers. Billy had not been trained to tail walk, but had learned the skill simply by observing other dolphins in the rehab center. Another study involves a female dolphin named Karen. Karen was given a test in which she was rewarded with a fish for every piece of litter she brought to researchers. To maximize its bounty, she quickly learned to take a newspaper, keep it at the bottom of a tank, and tear off smaller pieces to get more fish. Over the past hundred years, researchers have proven that dolphins are extremely social species and have evolved to have highly developed brains. These factors are the most significant contributors to their intelligence and become the means of survival for dolphins. In 2008, researchers tracked a group of around 400 dolphins. One female dolphin in the group was having a lot of trouble swimming and kept flipping upside down or sinking into the water. The other dolphins crowded around it. They paddled side by side with the injured female on their backs. By keeping the wounded female above water, they may have helped it to breathe, avoiding drowning. So how do they communicate with each other? Well, scientists have discovered, through observation and meticulous testing, that every dolphin has a different sound, resembling the whistle that other dolphins recognize as a particular individual. Dolphins can emit a wide variety of sounds. The frequency levels range ten times beyond what humans can hear. But of course, there are other means of communication for dolphins besides sound. During mating season, male dolphins stroke females with flippers after a fight to affirm social bonds. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.